Uh, Denmark, as we said, is very often given as the example. They have uh, not only uh, about uh, nearly 30% penetration of, of, uh, of wind energy in their system. If you look at, at wind energy, however, uh, th the problem is, of course, as everyone knows, that wind is intermittent. Okay? And uh, what this translates into is that the uh, capacity and the load factor of, of, of wind uh, are quite reduced. So if, if you look at the amount of time in a year you can use a wind turbine and produce electricity that's useful to, uh, to the grid and to people, that amount between what is promised by the manufacturers and by studies done, uh, theoretical studies and modeling studies and so on, and what is actually measured in the field has no bearing. Uh, the, the load factors that are achieved in the field are of the order of 18 to 20 percent as opposed to the 30 or 35 percent that we are promised very often. So that's a very serious issue because it impacts directly the cost and economics of the more seriously, and again, another thing that really um, highlights why it's absolutely necessary to have a system perspective, is again, if we go to the simplistic thinking, wind is renewable, replacing uh, a natural gas power, uh, power plant with wind is always going to be good. If I can go all the way to 100%, it's going to be fantastic and I'm going to be uh, removing and substituting for CO2 emissions. Well, that isn't the case. Why? Because uh, we live in North America and in Europe in societies which expect reliabilities in uh, their supply of power of the order of 98-99%. Look at how people went hopping mad when they didn't have power for three days. Okay? In Africa, in Southeast Asia, and so on, it's not unusual for people to have power three or four hours a day. That's how they function. They're used to that, but we can't live with that. Okay? So what does that mean? That means that in North America, in Vancouver, for example, if we want to deploy wind to a great extent, we need to have in the background spinning reserves. These spinning reserves are going to make up for the idiosyncrasies of the wind. We don't know we we have no way of being able to reliably predict how much wind is going to blow in an hour or let alone in a day. So we have to have spinning reserves. That means conventional power generation plants that are going to be idling, okay, so that if the wind abates, we can quickly bring them up to speed and make up for that deficit in the grid so that you and I cannot see that there has been a deficit. Um, power plants are designed to operate most efficiently when they're at the design modes. When they're idling, they're very inefficient. And so what happens is that it turns out if you do your map, if you introduce more than about 30% power, uh, wind power into the grid system, you start having, uh, you, you, you pass the point of diminishing returns. You're in fact having, you're not only increasing the cost of electricity to consumers, but you're having a negative impact on greenhouse gas emissions because you're not doing Solar power. Um, this is a study within a few years. I'm not going to go in detail. The issues there with the solar power is again intermittency, uh, land usage. So, for example, uh, this shows the amount of uh, storage that you need in the form of, of uh, cylinders of, of hydrogen in this case, you could do it with batteries, it's, it's even worse. Uh, in order to be able to supply residential demand in Victoria and the amount of uh, land that would be required to supply this area of Victoria with wood soil. Needless to say uh, that with the cost of land going on, that would not be economic. <coughs> Tidal. Tidal is given uh, great expectations. Uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, tidal currents around uh, Vancouver Island that uh, can potentially uh, be used. Uh, there's a study that was recently done by uh, Chris Garrett and a few other people here at Ubiquin. 
And what, what's shown through modeling of hybrid currents is that there is, in fact, a fairly significant amount of power that's available. In the discovery passage, you can have about uh, 400 megawatts of power. That this is roughly about 20% of the peak power production on Vancouver Island. And there are other sites. The key thing is that these power generation sites are not connected <coughs> because if you deploy an array of underwater turbines to recover the tidal currents, the, the kinetic energy in the tidal currents, uh, you're going to uh, change the flow of currents through essentially water like any gas is going to want to go to the path of least resistance. So there are limitations associated with that. And there are also impacts in terms of what happens. For example, currently if you deploy uh, in, in one of these channels, you can have uh, reductions in uh, the flows in the particular channel, as well as increases of the flow rates in other channels. That has uh, an impact on uh, the ecological impact, which is as yet uh, really not well understood. Biofuels, I'm going to go 